Foot Clan, it's always a good time to avoid the hustle and bustle at the grocery store. And HelloFresh delivers everything you need to get dinner on the table right to your door, contact free. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 10footballers and use the code 10footballers for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers back with you Thursday, February 25th. Mm. Mm. Gentlemen, there is uh, a lot on the plate today and plenty that I don't necessarily want to remember from 2020. Sure. However, sure. however, there are some things. Well, we're not remembering the the bottom 10 things to remember from 2020 here. <laughs> this is the top 10 things to remember. And the, the best oh, part man. about it, the bottom 10 is bad. The bottom 10 is not great. It was not great. Uh, but the best part is that this is top 10 things to remember for fantasy football. So no matter what, it's going to be fun because I realized, I think today that I love to talk about fantasy football. You just realized that. Yeah, and it was like big revelation, epiphany yeah. moments. Like, man, I love talking about fantasy football. Thousand plus shows. That that's what it took. We got here. <laughs> he eased his way in. <laughs> been, been dragging him along this whole time, like a pair of pants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on board now, though, fellas. <laughs> that's good. And we have uh, we've done this show each and every year. We, you know, the season is long and full of terrors. There's a lot that happens. There's a lot that goes on that we need to remember in, in recency bias and the way your season ended up and the way players played at the end or the beginning. You know, there's a lot that we learn each and every fantasy season. So we like to have these shows to gather that information together. Each of us brings three different things to remember from the past year. Lessons we've individually learned, things we want to apply to 2021 to make us better fantasy football players, to make you a better fantasy football player. So that's what we're getting into today. Very excited about that. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't look at your guys's. Oh, I fantastic. There's a chance I copied it. I don't. I mean, I wouldn't even know. Maybe it's like eight things to remember, <laughs> but two of us agree on them. I do not know. So I'm looking forward to hearing from each of you uh, what you guys have on the 10 things to remember list. Before... Two. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, two, of, two of mine were... You know, it, we talk about... The, the reason we do the show is because... It's so quick and easy to forget the lessons we learn. And we always think mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to repeat this mistake again. I'm not like, I will remember this. And then after doing this show for years, every time, you know, in the beginning, it was like, okay, we're going to come up with the things we want to remember. And I'm like, man, I knew I had so many, but what were they? And over the last couple of years, I've started actually like when I learn a lesson in mid season or, you know, towards the end of the season, I actually, you know, in, in my own little fantasy journal. I'm jotting these things down like I want to remember this. So this show helps amplify that. It's literally the lessons that I personally want to remember for the next year. And and two of mine were were things that I wrote down. And I'm so happy I did because I, I probably would not have remembered. And hopefully this this becomes a prescription for me. Because like if I don't say it on this show, I probably will forget it again. Yeah, especially the older you get. I mean, yeah, I'm and almost I also 80. You're, you're getting up there, and I, I hope it's a more of a lock and key diary situation where you r run into the room, you pull it out from under the mattress, you look for the key, you find the key, you open it up, and you scribble it in there. It's That's actually right. one of those those voice activated ones where oh. like the little brother tries to break in. <laughs> Not today, Junior. And you'll reveal those secrets on today's <laughs> show. Well, just a few of them. And Mike has stuff to say, too. I mean, Mike, you have a good memory, though. I do have a good memory. So no Thank diary you. necessary. Big news. Big, big news. This is uh, the last show before March 1st, which means this is my last chance means to remind you. my birthday's you. coming up, everybody. Oh, great. Get your gifts in the mail. Gosh dang it. We got to buy him something again <laughs> I'm every year. Going to be a birthday boy again. Now, we, we did buy Mike a present, I don't know, three, four <laughs> years ago. 
<laughs> we got him one of those like something on a Kickstarter. Uh-huh. And it was supposed to deliver like in three months, and he is still waiting. I think we're on four years now. I think so, we're on but four this, years. Which means if it comes soon enough, that will be this year's birthday present. I feel like almost putting them on blast. Maybe that's the key. But then uh, it's don't like free advertising, and they don't oh. deserve anything. Okay. Well, I won't do that. But, Mike, um, it's in the mail. It'll be here soon. <laughs> Hey, go over to ultimatedraftkit.com right now. Like I said, this is our last show before March 1st. March 1st is your last chance to uh, be entered to win the very first Listener League spot for 2021. How do you enter? Well, you pre-order the UDK right now because you get the most uh, amount. Well, you get the biggest discount. You get $15 worth of gift cards. You get early access to stuff. Uh, If you get the UDK Plus, you get the Dynasty Pass. And you get a chance to win a Listener League spot. So this is a very important... Yeah, oh, man. Yeah, yes. yeah. The people love it. Yep. The socially distanced studio audience really enjoying <laughs> that uh, promo. UltimateDraftKit.com, though. Check that out. It is going to be very exciting to give that spot away. Yeah, and and, and I would just add to that, you know, we, we're making a big deal of the, the Listener League spot that we're giving away, and that's just a cool giveaway for someone that is an early adopter of the Ultimate Draft Kit. But don't forget that... The ultimate draft kit is actually freaking outstanding. It's it the, it's going to help you win in your leagues and win a championship. So uh, it, it's well worth it. All right, uh, let's go ahead and do some buy sell. Buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. Well, today's buy or sell is a topic I. Really don't even enjoy talking about it all. So um, really, no, I'm tired of talking about this. <laughs> I, I think I am. I'm worn out talking about this. So let's. You mm. guys can rejuvenate me maybe with some optimism. Uh, buy or sell. Josh Jacobs having more than 35 receptions in this upcoming 2021 season. Josh Jacobs and reception speculation is uh, well. It's just always going to be there. He came into the NFL with a very Small sample size is a between the tackles runner and a uh, producer on the ground and a big sample size of being a great pass catcher that John Gruden doesn't necessarily want to use that way all the time. In 2019, he had 20 receptions in 13 games. Last year, I think we shot for the 35 mark. He fell short 33 in 15 games. He finishes the RB8. So why do I feel so bad about Josh Jacobs if he goes from RB18 to RB8? I don't know because a lot of his a lot of his production came in some big games, Um, and uh, you know I think it was more about uh, a little bit, you know, a lack of consistency and and also just a disappointment off of week one because even though he was good throughout the majority of the season, week one he was he was the running back one. So you start twenty twenty as the best running back. He was your my guy. So you're on cloud nine. Has you know a hundred total. Uh, yards has three touchdowns had had the receptions right six targets four receptions you're on fire you're ready to go and then it was like okay well this was this was what could be but it's not what we're going to do with him um so that's why he was disappointing as far as the receptions though if you got to buy or sell 35 he was already on pace for more and if you look at you know i think the issue here if you're going to sell is injuries he's sure he has had a, a difficult time really staying healthy even when he's playing he's playing through some of these injuries that are clearly having an effect on his utilization his usage his uh, snap percentage so I I'm gonna buy because I think he's clearly got the talent for it I believe they want to do it and I'm not going to I'm not going to just project injury for a player who has to this point played through most of the injury so he's not one of those we you know one of those guys who just bows out at every little thing um so I think you know if he plays 16. He'll beat that mark. And 35 is not a, a huge mark. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. We had 23 running backs that hit that mark, including James Conner, uh, Chris Carson, Devin Singletary. So, I mean, it's just barely just, over two like, receptions a game. Gruden. Come on, man. <laughs> like, like, stop being a curmudgeon and pass Josh Jacobs the ball a little bit more. You you told us all about how you wanted to get him the, the ball in, in the in the receiving game last year. And you you give us thirty three receptions is diabolical. The things that you did to us last off season. And this is why I'm tired of talking about it because we said <laughs> all of that stuff and we still didn't get the full payoff. That being said, 
You make some good points, Jason. I should be more optimistic here. I will buy 35. I think that that's doable. I'm not going to presume injury, like you said. Over the last decade, 47 running backs have finished with at least 1,000 rushing yards, 8 rushing touchdowns, and 35 receptions. They've all been RB1s. So he obviously proved last year, yes, he had a great week one. You still have to have about 14 other good weeks to end up as the RB8. And uh, he got there. So it seems like he's going to be along with Derek Carr again next year. That's the way it's looking. Yeah, I'll buy it because I don't think 35 is very much. All right, that was Buy or Sell, brought to you by our dear friends at Pristine Auction. PristineAuction.com. Use that code BALLERS. BALLERS. And you get a $10 credit. Uh, when you use the code, you do need to use kind of a sultry voice when you enter it. Mm -hmm. When typing. Right. B. B. <laughs> a. Finish it out there. Double and, L. Uh, you'll get, you'll, you'll get ten, a $10 credit for your, uh, your first win. That's like a that's like an Adam Lefko captcha that you guys are. <laughs> yeah. B C. Are you a robot? No. Are you Adam Lefko? Yes. How many stop signs do you see? <laughs> <laughs> All right, pristineauction.com. Use that code Ballers. Let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. Now, to be fair to us. I've been doing that ballers uh, echo bit. I've mm -hmm. been doing that way before I even knew who this Adam Lefko guy was. So you've cha yeah, it's, it's changed it's a little now. bit. It's yeah. his now. <laughs> it's got a different Fine. depth to it now. Yeah, it I used think. to be like ballers. Now it's like ballers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see the difference? <laughs> you see the huge difference? Yeah, totally <laughs> Lefko now. I feel like we're a bit Batman all of a sudden. <laughs> all right. News and notes. Big Ben's player reps of the Steelers have confirmed they want him back for 2021. He sat down with uh, the team. They're going to work on the contract. He'll be back. I mean, that's that's the message. Yeah, Big we, Ben's going to be back. We had his full statement from the team uh, acknowledging all these things. But the end of the statement was, now we got to fix the contract. So Yeah, they're, they're, and they're going to. the. Did you see Juju say he – desperately wants to be in Pittsburgh. He wants to retire there. He wants to have his legacy there. I just don't know how they afford him. I don't think they want to afford him. <laughs> right? Yeah, it seems like he wants That's it, really but... nice that you want to do that, Juju. Um, Will you take $3 million? <laughs> Uh Nope. Yeah. Uh, maybe Big Ben can... He said he didn't need to get paid. Maybe he can donate uh, towards the cost. We'll see. Uh, NFL Network's Ian Rappaport reporting the Cowboys want to extend Dak. <laughs> That's the news? Yeah, I think no. so. No. But they uh, want to do it right now. Well, he can play out 2021 with a fully guaranteed $37.7 million under his second consecutive franchise tag, or they can extend him, and it, the deadline's March 9th. So. Or they can, or they, and they can tag him while they work on an extension, too. Did you guys realize the, the franchise tag window is now open? So players can be tagged as of today uh, going forward through March 9th. All right. Uh, some free agency news. Chris Godwin says he wants to remain in Tampa, but he wants to get paid too. So doesn't want to give him a hometown discount. Top 10 wide receivers getting paid $16 million plus per year right now, according to Spot Track. Um, he seems like a great franchise tag candidate. Yeah, go back, run it back. Yeah. Franchise tag, man. That thing is brutal. This is rough. For the player? Yes. I mean, like, imagine being that player. You have, you have earned yourself a multi-year contract extension to be one of the highest paid wide receivers in the league. This is how it works. You prove it. And it, the, that, that money keeps going up and up and up. And then the team's like, well, hold on. We'll give you a lot of money, but it's only for one year. Don't get hurt. I think you're right. I think you're right. It is a little it's weird. It's rough. Yeah. I mean, you do get paid, but. Only for one year. You got to prove it again and you got to stay healthy and whatever mm -hmm. you do, don't get older. <laughs> yeah. Just it, <laughs> whatever you do, don't get older. Exactly. There is a, seems like a high probability that some of these guys, you know, are going to have a down year or Godwin could get hurt and all those things that you said. Um, Kenny Galladay, a candidate for the franchise tag. Would that yep. be under the principle of trying to trade him for a draft pick or? Just give Jared Goff a weapon. Possibly. It, the, the the trade speculation makes the most sense to me. You're 
they've acknowledged that they are rebuilding. They've they've burnt it to the ground. Now they need the ashes to rise like the phoenix. Why would you? Why why would you franchise tag Kenny Galladay? Pay him all that money for one year when you can get another piece to try and rebuild. It just it doesn't make sense to when when you have the foundation that they have. You don't go and get the wide receivers. You you need to build at other positions of need. Yeah, and you could always spend a lot less to bring in a one year right wide receiver kind of placeholder if you needed to. They're twenty million over the cap after taking on Goff's contract, so I don't think he's hanging around. I I don't see him as a candidate for the franchise tag, honestly. But uh, Aaron Jones could get up to fifteen million a year in free agency. This is reported uh, speculation from the Athletic. Um, there's only three that get paid that right now: CMC, Zeke, Kamara. It's going to be tough with the salary cap going down. It, it, he's going to make a lot of money, but I don't know if he'll get up to fifteen. It, the there is the the interest of the Dolphins. The Dolphins would be an incredible landing spot for Aaron Jones. He would see a ton of volume. the The team would the, the offense would be built around him. So if you've if you've got Aaron Jones on your dynasty team, you better be crossing your fingers for that one, Jason. Be- Aaron Jones to Miami or Aaron Jones back to Green Bay, which is better for you? Or- I would per- I would prefer him in Miami. Uh, you have fewer scoring opportunities. So e- even if his total fantasy points at the end of the season happens to be slightly lower or the same, I feel like the way they come is going to be far more consistent. You're going to have every single game he is, you know, the 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 centerpiece of the offense, at least the complete centerpiece of the running game. Whereas you know, you look the year before last when he was the running back two, but was not even a top 12 guy in consistency. That's what can happen when you're in this three-headed timeshare. I, You know, Jamal Williams, I expect him to re-sign with Green Bay. They've got A.J. Dillon there. So uh, the touchdown opportunity will be less in Miami, but I still think that, you know, you saw what they did with Miles Gaskin and Ahmed. And, uh, you know, if they took Aaron Jones and gave him $15 million a year, He'll be one of my absolute favorite running backs. That's interesting. I, I actually would go the other direction myself. I Oh, you're wrong. Oh, well, <laughs> but no, continue. It, you know what? <laughs> it, it makes sense. Um, no, he, the warning, the warning bells are going off for me. Get paid. Uh, been historically, what, like a 200 to 220 type of carry guy on a great offense, high efficiency. Uh, this is like I, I've used the example before. It's reminding me of the. You know, Miami Lamar Miller, 200 carries, five and a half a carry. You go to an offense where you're going to get the ball more. You're not going to score 16 touchdowns like you did in 2019. You might not get to nine like you did last year. Um, And then you have, I mean, that's a lot of volume in the passing game that is all of a sudden going to be translating to Tua. I mean, 49 receptions in 2019, 47 in 2020. I think I'd be slightly less uh, bullish on him in Miami personally. But I know that's a destination people want a running back to go to. I'm just not sure what it's going to represent next year. I'm with Jason. I I would be very excited. And speaking of Dolphins news, we do have a, a, a verified ESPN account tweeting, Deshaun Watson would approve a trade to the Jets, the Dolphins, and the Panthers. There could be more teams we don't know about, but those three have been confirmed. Andy, which of those teams would make you the most excited for Watson? I mean, we're all excited for Watson. I get that. But which of these teams would you be most excited about? Carolina. Carolina had uh, – they've got the receivers that give me confidence, and they have a head coach and flashes from last year, CMC coming back. Like if he went there and they don't lose CMC, I think that would make me the most excited of those right. destinations. Well, Jason? You, I, I, the, where it would make me the most excited, it's actually not one of those three, but it is technically the second highest Vegas odds on favorite right now. Um, so he hasn't confirmed that he would approve it. But the Broncos are are coming after him with a lot of heat. And that's one of those situations where we've talked a lot about. Is this Jerry Judy related? It's Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, and Noah Fant. It's all three. It's it's. I like the players, and I, I don't want any of them on my fantasy rosters next year. But if all of a sudden they inherit Deshaun Watson, I'm like, let's yeah. let these talented players be relevant for fantasy and give me confidence in them. I'd be all about that life. Well, we're going to find out what happens. It's going to be a very, um, you know, impactful piece of news for all the peripheral pieces. You know, from if he leaves Houston, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out what happens to D- DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson. Oh, baby. Yeah, there's um, there's no player this offseason that's going to affect 
more other players because you you had Stafford change teams and Goff change teams, Carson Wentz changed change teams. They, they they didn't really affect that many players all that drastically. But the new destination, those wide receivers and pass catchers, will be ginormously impacted. And then conversely, you're still impacting. You know, Brandon Cooks, who's a great fantasy option right now, becomes far less relevant, or David Johnson. So, yeah, he's going to be a monumental piece of news. Before we jump into the t uh, top 10 things, not the bottom 10, the top, top 10, 10 things, top 10 things to remember, we want to thank today's sponsor, Fight Camp. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. This episode is brought to you by Fight Camp. Fight Camp brings the boxing gym right to your home with a mix of cardio and conditioning for a full body workout. Fight Camp is made for beginners, uh, or is made for beginners to experienced boxers. Do you want to box from home? You get the Fight Camp. It comes with all the gear you need to box at home. They got the freestanding punching bag, the gloves, quick hand wraps, and their unique punch tracking sensors show you real-time progress and stats on any iOS device. I am getting a Fight Camp. I am very excited to show my beginner pow, skills. Pow, pow, pow. Sense these sense these hands, Fight Camp. I don't know if they're ready for these. They're they're probably very Nobody's ready. Nobody's ready. <laughs> very, very, very ready. Uh you jump on the app, it comes with over six hundred workouts and tutorials. They release twelve new boxing and kickboxing workouts every week. This is safe for kids. You don't have to worry about heavy weights with the kids or or any other things, but they can they can strap on the gloves and get in on this. Join the Fight Camp community, connect with the fight uh fight camp community. Fight Camp offers financing so you can pay over 24 months and get your new gym now. And Fight Camp offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. Just go to joinfightcamp.com slash footballers. That's right. Give Fight Camp a try within 30 days. If you don't love it, send it back. Get a refund. Fight Camp is the new way to work out at home. Make a change and join the community that teaches you the art of boxing while following the most intense workouts that are as quick as 15 minutes. To get free shipping on Fight Camp, just go to joinfightcamp.com slash footballers. Join fightcamp.com slash footballers. Don't forget to remember these things. Oh, that's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to forget to remember them. You know what I mean? If you or do you? Uh, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the setup there. Uh, 10 things to remember from 2020. Mike is going to kick it off. All right. Number 10. <laughs> I forgot that was happening, but here we are. Uh, this happened to me this year, and I was uh, guilty. I'm, I'm on a fantasy football show. We are giving waiver advice each and every week. But here's the thing. It's better to be a few weeks early on rookies, uh, to stash them than it is to be too late and look for the bye weeks. Those have been a very strong uh, signal in the past that a team is going to make a switch to running backs. I mean, you look at, look at what J.K. Dobbins, DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, all of them, the uh, their opportunity wasn't the clearest to begin the year. I mean, they, some of them were still drafted like it was there, but these rookie running backs who have established veterans in front of them, they get drafted early, and a lot of the times these players get dropped because the first three to four weeks, they aren't as involved as you want. And then you when you get into the middle of the week or middle of the season, just start stashing these players. Like who are I, you who else are you gonna pick? I mean, you can pick up a guy for a one week thing, but you gotta think long term. You gotta start getting ready for the second half. And for that playoff push, and no one is going to give your team a boost like a rookie running back who inherits a starting job or takes over a starting job, especially after that bye week. Like, look, Dobbins after the bye week, week eight, he was the running back 17, and it was done. Like, if you had waited to pick up Dobbins uh, at that point, congratulations, you're spending your waiver priority. Any fab you have left, you're going to have to drop it on him this same thing for DeAndre Swift coming off the bye week, the running back 13. And then Cam Akers, after the bye week, it was, uh, uh, I believe it was the the highest running back rush share that he had seen over the season after the bye week. And then eventually he started picking it up and, and getting huge volume and winning people weeks uh, at the end of the season. Ooh. So stash these guys. It's okay. Be early. 
Let them sit on your bench. Let them, uh, you know, uh, over time, like a fine wine. Well, it's it's hard. It's I, I'll, it I'll give you my experience with this, and the advice is important because it bears itself out every year. But it's still very difficult because I I was the case of adding Cam Akers as a mid season add, and uh, when a rookie sits on your bench for a couple of weeks doing nothing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you are scrambling and you are streaming other positions and you are making injury adjustments, holding on to him, I didn't hold on to him. I let him go back into the uh, free agency. So it was something that I regretted, obviously, in the end when Cam Akers was on fire, but it's still a very difficult thing to do. And yet year after year, you you bring up this year's examples. You know, Miles Sanders came on so strong the year before, um, and it happens. Nick Chubb a couple years ago. That's right. Yeah, And it's like you're saying, keeping a rookie running back on your bench – well, you're like, well, well, this this wide receiver four is producing. I have some bye weeks coming up here that I'm gonna. I know that this guy's actually producing, and this this running back isn't doing anything. I think in the in the long run, it's better to hold on to that rookie running back and then figure out the wide receiver who has to fill in on the bye week and and just be ahead of the curve a couple of weeks. That that is the approach that I will be taking next year yeah part part of the reason we do these you know things to remember shows is the difficulty it's the fact that it's not it doesn't happen naturally you're not going to have a rookie stink three weeks in a row picking him up halfway through the season and want to hold on to him we have to remember to hold on to him because it's it feels unnatural but we've got enough history and evidence to say you know let's do it and and that I think leads in uh well to my next tip, number nine. Number nine. All right. This is going to be tough. It's emotionally difficult to do this, but I am going to remember to sell my wide receivers who are on fire one month into the season. When oh, I have the, man. I know it's There's tough. There's no it's way. Hard. No, There's no, no, no. Way. I, I, I know. Now, there is a caveat I feel caveat like we really need to follow up on this one. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yes, like, we do. Like, maybe trade them to me? No. I want, no, absolutely. I want to remember this a month into the season. I need to, like, set a timer right now to, rem- to remind me to bring this up on the show one month in because I believe in what I'm saying here. This was one of the notes I made to myself, you know, uh, mid to three quarters the way through the season. And I'm not talking about the the superstar of superstars, right? If you draft Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams and Michael Thomas and they're great, you, you, you paid a ton for them. But there are always these wide receivers who are just dominating and you think it's never going to go away. Here, Here's an example. The top 15 wide receivers going into week five included Tyler Lockett, who was uh, the number two. He was unbelievable. Just couldn't ever uh, cool down. Amari Cooper. DK Metcalf, who would have gotten you anything you want in fantasy. Odell Beckham, Robbie Anderson, CeeDee Lamb, rookie sensation, already top 15. And Cooper Cup, who had a great start to the season. These guys can net you a lot. And here's why I'm saying to trade them. I talked about this all throughout the season. We talked about it a lot on the Truth of the Wide Receiver series. Wide receivers, all of them, outside of like the number one, two, and three guys, are super inconsistent. All of them. So if you know that you've got a month of good games, you know that they're not going to keep doing that. It's just not going to happen. It's the exact same thing as a wide receiver who has four great games later in the season, and yet it feels completely different, right? If they have four great games at the end of the Mm -hmm. season... Well, they sucked, and then they just got lucky. But if they have four great games at the beginning of the season, they are legit. They're for real. It's part of the game plan. They're, it's never going to cool off. Except- because they, because you think they, they could be. Exactly. They might be. I mean, they this could be the new be. normal, especially with someone like Robbie Anderson, because I, I want to relate this again to, to real life. I had Robbie Anderson. He's in a new home. He dominates for four weeks. This is the new normal for Robbie Anderson. I resisted trading him. I thought about trading him. I didn't trade him. I wish yeah, I, I traded him. I, I, and, I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I get it. And, and it's not to say that this will have a 100% hit rate. Nothing in fantasy football, nothing has a 100% hit rate. But the statistics say that these guys are not going to keep up the pace they start with when they're dominating the first four weeks of the season. And it never feels like they'll cool off. They've been great for four weeks you can sell them for a king's ransom 
And at that point, you I mean, let's say they let's say they don't cool off, right? It's Stephon Diggs, right? Now, he would have been a mistake to trade him after four weeks. Sure. But if you're getting value on For Hopkins. Yeah, if you're getting that level of value in return, then so what? If you you still could make a good trade having traded Stephon Diggs away. But if it turns out that the statistical probability of these wide receivers not staying this consistent and hot through the rest of the season comes to fruition, you're going to maximize your value. So a month into the season, I'm going to be trading my wide receivers who are on fire. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. I'm going to have to watch this segment again to remind myself <laughs> that it's the right move. All right. I think it's my turn. Number eight. All right. We started from the top and now we're here. I took a look at the first 20 picks in this uh, past year's draft. Those prize picks, those spectacular guaranteed superstar picks, uh, nine of them, nine of the top 20 picks, quote unquote, delivered for your fantasy team. That is less than 50%. This is something that um, it bears repeating every year. Six of them failed, struggled due to injuries. We know CMC and Barkley and Michael Thomas. And like injuries are going to be a piece of the equation in the top 20 picks. Uh, four or five other ones underwhelmed severely. You know, Zeke, maybe that's the offense and what happened. Clyde, Kenyon Drake. Here's the thing we say it every single year you don't win your league at the draft. You have to stay water. You have to remember to roll with the punches. And you have to continuously build depth throughout the year. The mindset that would be the most problematic for a fantasy football player that we need to remember each and every season because we spend the entire offseason painting a beautiful picture of our team and you've got your two running backs and your two wide receivers and you've got your flex and everything is it's like chiseled into stone. You think that they're locked. You think you you have a position locked down and you just don't. And this Rem this number that I'm bringing up here, uh, number eight, is to remember the fact that you will never get to autopilot your season based on the draft. You will never get to autopilot it based on maybe you're in a league where you've secured three or four picks in the top 20. That still does not mean that you have the season on lockdown or on autopilot. And so I thought it was interesting to look at those top 20 picks and just see how, you know, sideways it can go on any given season so it's better to have people waiting in the wings it's better to never kind of rest on the laurels of the draft and um you know settle for whatever you have on your bench you need to be making moves you need to be keeping up with uh it each and every week yep i agree when you're when you are building a house you lay down your cement foundation and then you're not done <laughs> you don't call it a day like i got a i got a super sweet slab this is where I'm sleeping now. Oh, man, you got to finish the house. Pay yeah, attention. When, when your slab gets some cracks in it and the foundation breaks because CMC's gone, <laughs> you still want to have a house, right? You got to gotta, gotta gotta do patch. what you got to do, man. <laughs> Fix it up. We, we're really into construction <laughs> over here. Um, I do right. man things. It's back to you, Mike. Oh, Number seven. All right, number seven. Uh, this is a reminder, and we all we all know this. But I just want to take a second to, uh, I don't want to forget to remember. And I want to highlight what happened last year. Rushing quarterbacks equals fantasy football. Uh, you Here are the top 10 quarterbacks in rushing yards last year. Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, Cam Newton, Russ, Taysom Hill, Deshaun Watson, Daniel Jones, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, and Patrick Mahomes. Of that list, only Cam, Taysom Hill, Daniel Jones, and Jalen Hurts were not top 10 quarterbacks at the position. But of that list, only two guys, Cam and Daniel Jones, would be considered a disappointment. Look at Taysom Hill. In his four starts, he was averaging 21.6 points per game. Jalen Hurts in his four starts averaged 23.7 points per game. That would have been top 10 at the end of the year. It's just the way that fantasy is scored. You cannot, you cannot uh, underestimate how powerful, or overestimate, I should say, how powerful the rushing ability is to the, the quarterback when 10 yards is a point compared to 25 yards is a point. It just is a difference-making machine. Seek out the players who rush at the quarterback position. 
That's who you want to be looking at. If you are, it, it, I know that Lamar kind of disappointed uh, for relative to for, for relative to hopes his, and dreams. Yeah. Yes, but he still finished as a top as as a top ten guy, and he it's because of the rushing that he was able to come back. And when you are looking at next year's draft, like that's why Jason is so bullish on Jalen Hurts. That's why I am so bullish on him as well. I don't I don't care how good he is. Because he runs the football. He's it's, also good. Okay. It, but go on. I, but, I don't want to steal your point because your point is accurate. Go on. But, but like that's why we, we can we can disagree on Jalen Hurts. But I agree that he's going to run the ball a ton, and that just turns into a safety net for fantasy football. And in, even Cam Newton. Cam Newton was an incredible disappointment, but he still had his moments where you could plug and play Cam Newton due to all the rushing and the rushing touchdowns. You just wish he would would have thrown – the ball a little bit better over the course of the season so make sure when you're in your draft you are targeting someone at least who runs the ball a little bit more than just the it's hard to be the statue true pocket passing quarterback and really be an elite uh, fantasy football quarterback it's not impossible but it's just much easier for these guys who run yeah I, I I agree completely it always is disheartening um, because, you know, I, I look at some of these guys and, you know, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, they're good examples of like, they're, they're not, they're not great quarterbacks, but at the same time, they're just for fantasy. They're as good as you can get. And was that your uh, attempt to like, just make Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson just in the same sentence together? Like they just belong in the same company. Well, it was it was more than an attempt because I I did it, so I would say that was, that was you know a, it was a success. Yeah, these that's guys, right. these guys, the MVP, and then Jalen Hurts. Right, you know those those two guys that are yeah. so similar, the MVP and Jalen Hurts, um, yeah. future hey, MVP. Lamar Jackson didn't win the MVP his first year in the league. Well, we that's know right. who Jason thinks is going to win it in the second year. All right, that's right. next, <laughs> it's gonna hurt so good. All right, let's get Jason's to number turn. six. Number six. All right. I want to remember that mid-round wide receivers are better than mid-round running backs. Mm -hmm. And really, okay. I could title mm -hmm. this, mid-round running backs suck. That's really the point. Mm -hmm. Mid-round running backs suck. And and I've got to guide us here because mid-round, a lot of times you're thinking like, okay, does that mean like rounds like – six through 10. I, I'm speaking after those first two rounds. The first two rounds are so valuable in fantasy. Everybody knows it. If you've never played before, you can understand that, of course, the first two rounds have the best players. Outside of that, rounds three through seven is what I'm talking about as mid-round. Wide receivers are so much more valuable than running backs. I thought this going into last season. It came true again. And if you really look at those rounds, three and four especially, just don't grab a running back, man. And this is why, like, last year, I, I we want to stay water. We, we want to be fluid. And, and if the draft falls to us, I'm, I'm not locking myself in that I have to go running back, running back, or I won't take a running back later. I'm never going to lock myself in. But I want to remember the truth that usually those mid-round running backs suck. And mid-round wide receivers have a lot of hits, a lot of really uh, potential value there. And uh, let me give you an example here. So over the last five years, there's been 112 running backs taken in rounds three through seven. 62% of the time, they miss on their value. They don't provide value. 22.3% of the time, almost a quarter of the time, they are a complete landmine. Just a lighting that pick on fire. They finish 25 spots behind their ADP. And less than 10% do they provide like league winning value. Look at this last year, rounds three and four. You had James Conner miss, Chris Carson miss with injury, Todd Gurley sucked. Aye. Now you had Jonathan Taylor in, in, at the back of the third. Now that was actually the best you got pick. Bailed uh, out, but you got right, Andy. You drafted. Process was you, bad. You drafted Jonathan Taylor. Did you? Yeah. Were you happy with that pick midway through the year? Well, I think the bailout Mike is referring to is just Mac being hurt too. Yes. So I, I mean. No, I was mediocrely impressed. Sure, and and he had the great end of the season, so he was the best pick. The next best pick in the rounds three and four was Melvin Gordon. That was actually a hit. By, where was where well, was David? Gur Gurley Montgomery. was a hit. Gurley was a hit for a while. 
uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Gurley yes. was a hit for a while, but then he sucked and d- no yeah, longer yeah. has a career. Uh, <laughs> Lev Bell sucked. David Johnson was a good Leonard Fournette. Yeah. Raheem Mostert. Like, they're all misses. Now look at the fourth-round wide receivers. Adam Thielen, Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley, A.J. Brown, Robert Woods, D.K. Metcalf. So build this your This is why you draft a- running backs early. Exactly. Because if, if you want that wide receiver or early. Or super, super late. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, uh, you know, mid round wide receivers are, they're just, they are much better odds on, they're much better it's bets. Good. It's good. It's a good thing to remember. Mid round running backs. Yeah. I, I went and I took a look back uh, all to 2017 and was, you know, evaluating these 80 by their ADP. Like, it, did you finish at least a couple spots within your ADP or, or you could, way exceeded as well but say you're drafted as the running back 20 if you finished as the running back 22 i counted that as it was fine you you, you basically returned value rounds three through th- three through six just an absolute negative correlation a negative uh return on investment when you're drafting running backs there meanwhile over at the wide receiver position you're at least 50 percent or better it, a a weird anomalous thing though for me in in my research Round seven for running backs, those those guys returned or exceeded value at a at at, at a very rapid pace. So well, the reason for this is because we're getting we're getting better as, uh, as analysts as an industry at projecting the correct running backs, and so they they are in the first and second, and then those next couple rounds after that are all the well it could be uh, they're right. older. Or there's there's always a bunch of reasons why they couldn't hit, but they could be, and a you need running Tariq, backs. So Tariq Cohen has to go somewhere. I mean, right. that is, he's got to go in the middle round somewhere. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's a good thing to remember. I love it. Let's uh, let's get to number five. Number five. I'll keep it brief, guys. Great tight ends are my new best friends. All right, great yeah. tight ends are my new yeah. best friends. I got to experience the absolute joys of being a tight end one fantasy manager this year in multiple leagues, and frankly, I could get used to it. Uh, it's one thing to strategically accomplish the whole tight end streaming world. We, we try to help you do that throughout the year. It can be done. Most people have to do that. Most people have to do that. That's a, that's a good reminder there. And you know what else is fun? Finding George Kittle in the late rounds or Mark Andrews in the late rounds. That's fun too. That being said, Kelsey Waller, you don't got to deal with any of that. You just plug them in your lineup. You won the position. Each and every week, you got an extra roster spot on your roster each and every week. You can strategize whatever else you want to do. You want to put your mind energy into streaming quarterbacks or streaming your defense or depth for injuries. Guess what? You have one less thing to make a part of your strategic decisions each and every week. And I'm telling you, Kelsey belongs in the first round. Yeah. Having it on lockdown has, it was absolutely a delight. My opponents feared me every week. And um, I mean, you get extra fab like you right draft draft drafting Kelsey gives you extra fab or more waiver priority o- over your opponents because you're not using them at the position. What a neat way to think about it. When you are drafting Travis Kelsey in the back of the first round, you are drafting Kelsey plus 20 fab or Kelsey <laughs> plus 30 plus 30 fab exactly. because I mean, that's the truth of it. You are not spending that on a speculative Jack Doyle ad or a Moali Cox or a you know, uh, Trey Boo Boo. Why did I just name three Colts? <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I you know, next year y- you look at it and you say Kelsey Kittle, Waller, distinct strategic advantages more than ever before in the wasteland of tight ends. So for me, that was that was one of my big takeaways in 2020. Number four. All right, easy like Sunday morning. Sunday mornings roll around. You're frantically looking for news. You're setting your lineup. You're done. Set it. Forget it. Let's go watch some football. Don't be lazy. And I'm talking to myself because I missed a few times on these as well. When you have a player who becomes IR eligible, move them. Move like this. Make sure this is part of your Sunday morning process. Move them to the IR. Get that extra roster spot and go add somebody. It, this is your chance that you found a scratcher on the ground as you're leaving the grocery store, and it's <laughs> it's just there. You know what? This thing's probably – you're going to scratch it. It's probably going to go right back in the garbage. But it is a scratcher. It could 
It could net you some sweet cash that and you just found it and you get you beat everybody else to it. Like a couple examples last year. Jordan Reed. I picked him up on a Sunday morning because I had an extra spot. Now it didn't work out. I got to slam dunk on Jason, and that it, felt it really felt good. Ba- it felt bad. <laughs> <laughs> and that felt good. And and honestly, like I, I believed in Jordan Reed too, but Boom I, shakalaka. Thank you. I could have perhaps taken that moment to try and trade Jordan Reed to Jason, a guy that I picked up for free. Jason was going to spend up to get him. Uh, in the playoff run, the the 49ers running backs, and, and, and here's the thing. You, you're looking at your waiver wire going, there is absolutely nobody there. This is your chance to play what if, what could happen. What if a running back here gets an opportunity in front of him? This pairs really well with stashing rookie running backs uh, also, by the way, but I looked at the 49ers situation, and Jeff Wilson was coming back from injury, and it was, well, okay, what if something happens and Jeff Wilson is all of a sudden the, the starting running back for the 49ers? That and I picked him up on Sunday morning. I had no fab. That week, Jeff Wilson stumbled into a whole bunch of opportunity, and that singular move won the league for me, our league of record. I have I would have had no chance if I had not picked up Jeff Wilson right there. I would have not had a chance to pick up Jeff Wilson on the on the waivers because I would have had to I, I didn't have fab. I couldn't do anything about it. So make sure you don't be lazy. Sunday, do this with all your leagues where you can move players onto the IR. That's where I'm really looking in the mirror at myself. I would I had I would hyper focus on a couple leagues. I'd go check my my uh my roster on some other league and I go, oh man, Julio was out, wasn't he? I forgot to put him on the IR. So don't be lazy on Sunday morning. Just grab somebody who has potential. Lazy well, you, on a Sunday morning. You were uh you were very good at that this year. Not Thank to you. mention, I mean, even if you took away the fantasy points you received. The ability to strut after you make a move like that, <laughs> that mm-hmm. next week's is, you know, you did it with Jordan Reed. He didn't pan out in particular, mm-hmm. but being able to do that, that walk, that dance right in it's front fun. of somebody and say like, oh, let me go pick up that. Oh, wait, you picked them up when? Whenever you get a, a person before the breakout, oh, 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 oh yeah. man, yeah, you look good. like a super genius. You get to strut and it, it feels real bad to be the other person. I can speak to that. All right, I believe that means Jason is up next. Number three. All right, this one is the early bird gets the worm. And I'm not talking about having to wake up before your opponents to get a waiver wire pick in. I'm talking on the course of the season. And this is really, truly, truly, truly one that I need to remember. You two, you get it. But I struggle with this every single year. It's been two years in a row. I've told myself I'm going to be better, and I haven't. Here's the point. Spend your waiver priority and spend up at fab early in the season. I struggle with it. I never want. I'm like, well, what if it does? What if it doesn't pan out? What if it doesn't work out? What if I spend a lot and it, and, and it's not the right guy? I want to hold and wait until I know that surefire guarantee is coming. Jason, when when you were a kid and you got it was your birthday, you get fifty bucks or whatever for your birthday. Did you have that problem? Back then, too, where like you'd, you'd go to the store, you have all your your new money, and you just couldn't pick out a, a like a toy or something. Did that happen to you? I I don't think so. I think as a kid, it was well, I can have it right now. So okay. yes, please. <laughs> in translate. So, so I need to be more childlike um, in in my in my favorite uh, or my my fab decisions. Favor. I I went fab and waiver. It's a favor. It's a favor. Yeah, it's your favor. I, I like it. The favor um, wire. The favor wire. <laughs> it's my favorite wire. Um, my my point is this. There's there's two advantages here. Advantage number one is that the true breakout players are going to get their opportunities earlier. At, you know, you you look at uh, James Robinson. You look at uh, Justin Jefferson. Really early in the season, they broke out, and the second half of it is. It's just math. It just makes more sense. Look, if if I spend 50 fab dollars for someone in week one, I have the chance of 16 weeks of value. That's that's three fab dollars a week versus if I spend $50 for fab. We're doing budgets now? I, I mean, I'm just <laughs> look, mathematically, it makes sense. You get more per dollar if you spend early in the season than you, you get do. if I spend you do. $50 on uh, you know a, a player in week 10. Then I Look, get if, that's ten bucks a week. If there's two things of Tupperware in the fridge and you don't know whether either one is good, why not take the one with more in it? 
Exactly. So I'm I, I I'm speaking to myself here because it's two years in a row. I, I have missed out on some players that I thought about going after. I didn't go hard enough after and I should have. So next year, that week one, I'm going to I'm going to, you know, see who I believe is has the best chance of, Hundred of fab breaking one. out. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to overcorrect, but at the same yeah. time, like I remember week one waivers, our, our show, um, I was talking up James Robinson. I, I said, look, he's there you got go. the chance. Good example. I, I believed in him. He was the one that I would have put my first waiver priority on. Now, we're, we're not in a waiver priority system. We're in a fab system. And I didn't spend enough. Uh, I he was who I believed and I did not spend enough to get him because I just want to save you know be frugal and and what what happens later I wish I spent up and grabbed him early just I'm gonna do it next year yeah just don't do that now that Mike's bringing up being a kid when you get that like wad of cash for your birthday and you go to the store I love how kids they will tell you they're saving all their money for one particular item you get to the store that item is out of stock and they are going to spend that money that day no matter what. Yeah. No, no, no. Nope. I really wanted this more than anything. All right. Uh, I guess I'm back up. Number two. No big slices from little pies, okay? You don't get a big <laughs> slice from a small pie. Beware. And we talked about this throughout the season, in particular with Lamar Jackson and, and Marquise Hollywood Brown. Beware of low volume passing offenses. That's the reminder. You cannot get enough value out of these offenses, no matter how talented these stars on the team seem to be. And I went and looked this past year, the bottom 10 teams in passing yards produced two top 24 wide receivers. It was AJ Brown at number nine. They're a low-volume offense, but very efficient. And then Terry McLaurin sneaked in at 23. Yeah. Good work, Terry. You know who is not on that list? Any Ravens, any Jets, any Patriots, any Giants, any Broncos, any Browns, any Eagles, any Bengals. None of them made it into the top 24. The pie was too darn small. Uh, we always optimistically hope that talent trumps all, but it is really, really, really hard for that to happen consistently enough to finish inside the top 24. You get the Jamison Crowder breakout week. You get a Sterling Shepard week like the end of the year. You get a Jarvis Landry week. But they can't do it enough because the passing volume pie is too darn small. And then the predictive, you know, it's really hard to predict success for breakout wide receivers when they are starting behind the eight ball. And Hollywood was the example a lot through the year. But like Denzel Mims and his chance at a breakout, Jerry Judy and his chance at a breakout, you need a bigger pie just to be – it's hard enough predicting it. You yeah, need an opportunity. A, you'd rather have the number two for a high passing volume team than the right. number one for a low passing volume team. Uh, just statistically, it's the truth, but it feels bad when you're grabbing a, a team's second player over I can get this team's number one player. Yeah, and we've seen that a little bit even in the running back realm where – you know, the Saints for years had multiple options you could play in fantasy, but then you could have the bell cow on a low, a bad rushing team, and it, they just never paid off, no scoring opportunity. So you do need to read into those offenses. You do need to think about volume, right? Because Baltimore, a good offense still. I mean, maybe not this year like they were last year, but still considered a good offense. You had good weeks from the Browns without question. You had good weeks from the Eagles or even the Bengals. But it wasn't passing volume, and that really, really hurt um, all of those teams in the bottom 10 in passing yardage. So I think that's a good reminder. Um, the Hollywood rule, maybe, is what it'll end up being called in the end. But, uh, yeah, no, no big slices from small pies. Number one. What's number one, guys? It is what it always is. This is the opportunity every year where we remind you so importantly to fix all your league settings. This mm -hmm. is when you do it. This is when you start the conversation. This is when you start taking a look at, oh, you know what? They always talk about fab. We've got this old waiver priority system. We should switch to fab. Oh, they always make fun of us because we're playing in a week 17 <laughs> championship. Listen, and we will always we, make fun of that. Well, we're very not, rude. We're very we rude. won't make not fun of you this year. Two years. Th we won't. If, if you are no this coming season. This coming Wait, season. Is that happening this year? It is in 2021. So everyone should be a week 17 championship <laughs> team this year. If you play in week 17 leagues, look, 
You were just ahead of the curve. You should you don't stay have to in fix week seventeen. Anything. You don't need to fix anything. You're a week seventeen. Don't tell your commission. Just week seventeen. And for everyone else, move from week seventeen, sixteen to seventeen, because there will be eighteen weeks in the NFL season next season. Seventeen games, um, and you don't want to play your championship game. Do we get paid overtime the- for the extra week? <laughs> I don't think so, man. It's pretty ridiculous. Do we, we, we don't have not- to pay the producers more, do we? Oh no, no, okay. never. No, we haven't given them a raise in five years, and we never yeah. will. All right. Yeah, I was gonna, I just trying to check our budget here. <laughs> yeah. Money, 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 oh, no. Money. Oh, Al found the button. Brooks gives himself raises. That's right. That's what we – we lean on him for that. <laughs> now, there are a lot of things, too. Kickers. Do you want kickers in your league? Super no, flex no, league? No, you don't. You want to change format? You want to change keepers? You want to do any of that stuff? You want to do it late February or start talking about it in February, March, not – a week before the season when everything's mm-hmm. kind of set in stone. Wow. And kick people out of your league if they stink right now and find somebody else. I just realized as we're talking about this, you know, we're we're getting close to the time of the year where we start statting out every single team, every single player. I mean, we we literally give We're a not stat that line. close, are we? I, we're, 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 we're not that there. far. Oh, no. But what I'm realizing is that everybody's stats are going to be so different this year. Because of the extra game, like oh my god, a thousand yard rushing season will be like everybody. You get one. Uh, you get we're gonna one. have to readjust. Oh my know it will be a whole take, new default. It will. I mean, thankfully, I usually stat people out on what I think per game and then extrapolate that out. So I can but already hear you see. giving me Jalen Hurts season long stats oh, in man. the historical context. That's right, thirteen thousand rushing yards. <laughs> Oh, that's true. And yeah. we're we're gonna re, we're gonna help you reset your brains for fantasy numbers and NFL numbers this year. I guess I, we'll be I learning. I feel like I'm you. I'm already locked in on he has to be a my guy. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> you got to wait for that ADP first. Yeah, that's <sighs> true. Well, I, I I'm gonna have to really spend some time in prayer deciding how much I want to oppose you this off season. Um, it's gonna be fun though. All right, that was our 10 things, top 10 things to remember from 2020. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that they were at least somewhat helpful. And uh, look, if you have some things that you wanted to remember, I'm sure you can uh, leave us some comments on Twitter at the FF Ballers, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Let us know what you learned this year. Look, learning lessons, it's not always easy. A lot of the times it's hard. But if you remember them for next year, you don't have to learn them twice. So that's, that's the true. goal. That's the goal. All right, that'll and do don't- it. don't. Don't forget, don't forget last chance to get oh, in yeah. on the listener league. Uh, if if you want to get it, go to ultimatedraftkit.com. Get the ultimate draft kit at the cheapest price. You are automatically entered into the listener league drawing. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.